Hello, everyone. Welcome to Yale SOM Exchange webinar, Creating Real Value in a Changing World. Yale SOM Exchange is the Yale School of Management series of online conversations that provides alumni and the entire SOM community the opportunity to continue learning about faculty research, current events, and career strategies. I'm so happy to be joining you today. My name is Margie Adler, and I'm Managing Director of Alumni Relations at the Yale School of Management, and I'm thrilled to be joined by Judy Samuelson, SOM class of 1982, Vice President of the Aspen Institute and author of the book, The Six New Rules of Business, Creating Real Value in a Changing World, which is out today. Signature programs under Judy's leadership include a 10-year campaign to disrupt Milton Friedman's narrative about corporate purpose, a multi-year dialogue to produce the Aspen principles of long-term value creation, and a partnership with Corn Ferry to rethink executive pay. She previously worked in legislative affairs in California and banking in New York's Government Center and ran the Ford Foundation's Office of Program Related Investments. She writes regularly for Quartz Network. Quartz at Work is a Bellagio Fellow and a Director of Financial Health Network. Judy, thank you so much for joining us today. It's great to see you again. It's really, really nice to be here. This book um, that you've written is so timely and has um, topics of such broad interest. We have people online today that are not only SOM alumni, but also alumni from across Yale University, current students, prospective students, and so many more. Uh, I have a lot of questions that I wanna to get to. Before I do that, I just wanna ask our audience um, to, uh, Judy and I are gonna talk for about 30 minutes about the book, and then we'll have time afterwards for audience questions. So please feel free while you're listening to us or afterwards, to submit your questions through the Q&A function and Judy and I will try to get to as many as we possibly can. So Judy, um, I've been thinking for a while about the questions to ask you and um, for the past several days, every day there's been something in the news that's really directly related to something that you wrote about in this book. So I'll start with the first question. Um, one of the things that you talk about in the book is the changing role of CEOs and corporations in um, affecting governmental change. And particularly given the spate in the last couple days of corporations who are putting a halt on their contributions, their political contributions to certain politicians, I wonder if you wanna talk a little bit about um, how you see that playing out um, going forward. Absolutely. Um... It's changing so quickly, it seems, and yet this has been building for a long time. But before I before I do that, I just want to tell you how honored I am to be doing this webinar on the day that this book that I've worked on for many years, um, but you know, really intently over the last the last year, is landing, and that I get to do this today with my peeps at Yale SOM. So, um, you know. The School of Management had a profound impact on me, not only taught me a lot and kind of created a, a way of thinking about business that was brand new to me, but it also, you know, I created Friends for a Lifetime at SOM. And um, I so thank you for having me and for Margie for shepherding the Alumni Association. It's an important institution in and of itself. So thank you. Um, so the role of CEOs, you know, uh, yeah, the last week, the, the thing that I find so interesting is that if you think back over the last four years, you know, over the kind of trajectory of the Trump presidency, there were a number of moments where CEOs were heard from. The very first one in his, in the presidency was really when, when Trump imposed the ban on a uh, visa ban for seven majority Muslim countries. And that really brought CEOs to the table. What we've seen is a real shift in the degree to which CEOs will speak to issues that are not exactly business issues. You know, there used to be a pretty clear line, you know, CEOs kind of kept, they didn't want to enter into the political fray. They didn't want to offend their customers by standing on one side or the other on a social issue like guns. Um, but that's all changed. And I write about this in the book. The reason it's changed is because for a lot of reasons, one, he really, that is a business issue when you're having problems accessing your own talent, having, worrying about them being able to get off the airplane. But it's also because of the rise of employees and their voice and their 
connectivity between wanting to kind of connect the outside world and the issues that they care deeply about, want them to kind of resonate inside the workplace. And they expect their leaders at this point to be able to be you know, a touchstone on things that they hold dear. So that's changed a lot. Even having said all that, I don't think I would have anticipated that in this moment, after a you know attack on our nation's capital and the Capitol building itself, that CEOs would again be at the center of the conversation. And um, so that speaks to a complicated issue, the you know this the role of money in politics, and um, it's one that I'm sure. People on the phone today or on the webinar today have thought deeply about from their own perspective. So we'll see what happens now. We'll see if this is a real reckoning for executives that are having to think about the consequences of their support. If that helps them step back and think about why am I why am I enter why am I using money why am I you know donating uh, money to politicians anyway? Like what is that about? Is that about private endearment and private benefit and you know uh, advantage, or is that something about the health of the commons? And I think it's more the former than the latter. And so I think it's gonna be interesting, interesting questions from here. I don't think CEO is gonna be stepping back. I think we're gonna to continue to hear from them. Right, right. So going back to something else that you just mentioned, one of your rules, rule number four, employees give people risk and competitive advantage. So can you talk a little bit more about how employees mirror public opinion? Absolutely. Um, you know, we if you kind of it, it kind of hung out in the kind of, uh, you know, business, corporate responsibility, ESG world, you know, you'd end up thinking about investors as a, as a kind of lever of change that somehow people that are trying to align their investment with their, you know, their, their values or, you think about consumers and camp various campaigns that we all know of that you know have taken place over over decades. Um, but you know none of those actually work that well. Investors are all over the map. They're conflicted. Some of them are short. Some of them are long. They come in lots of shapes and sizes. And uh, you know consumers, with all of our consciousness about various successful consumer boycotts and the like, they don't tend to hold. And um, consumers were bound to price and convenience. You know, let's let's be real about uh, the degree to which they actually prioritize other things over being able to get that package delivered quickly. So, you know, it's interesting. Employees, on the other hand, are fully aligned with the long-term health of the enterprise. They are. They are. Um, they sit both inside and outside and the kind of generation of employees who are coming into the workplace now expect the their kind of world outside of, of the company to connect deeply into their the place of work and how they work and what they're working for and we've seen lots of examples of this you know the google walkout was clearly a important moment we've now seen um this again, remarkable story about business in the last 10 days, it's all been shattered over now, but 10 days ago or so, 220 Google employees announced the formation of a union that they had been working on secretly for a long period of time and invited in contractors and vendors into that. So people that are working in the name of the company, but are not do not have the benefit and the protection of being on the payroll. So again, a remarkable change led by employees so we're going to continue to see this. This is not, we're not stepping back from this and empowered by kind of everything that they know about using Microsoft Teams and all of those, you know, social network uh, capacities. Business, I think uh, we see CEOs listening more to employees and we, the CEO, the kind of, I call it accountability from the cafeteria. You know, we are going to be hearing more from employees. Right, right. So, you know, th there's been so much that's happened over the past um, year or so. Uh, one of the things that we've seen, and you write a lot about this in the book, is, um, and we've seen this really uh, reflected in the world over the past year, is that the stock market is not the economy. Um, you talk about that in your book. I wonder if you can talk about that a little bit more. And, um, you know, talk about why capital markets have so much sway um, given other parts of the economy and, and what's been going on? Well, it certainly used to be true that, that 
the financial capital was a scarce resource. And so it was naturally something that companies cared a lot about and leaned in on and, and protected. Um, but that was when, you know, company value is built of bricks and mortar and, you know, hard assets. That of course has changed, you know, profoundly over the decades that, um, since I got out of business school. And, um, you know, intangibles are the, are the contributor real value. It's things that you can't measure, but it's also things that don't cost as much if you do, if you manage it right. So this world in which, um, the world in which we inhabit now um, has changed profoundly, both in terms of what we need to measure and kind of our real definition of value. So um, some of what you talk about related to that is- um, has Sorry, to do stock market. Sorry. We saw Sorry. the profound example of this last week, the stock market. Here it is, we've just had an attack on the capital and the stock market's booming along. Well, one can say, well, we're, you know, we're expecting better times and we're gonna turn this around. And, but it's certainly not a bellwether. And as a market, it is, you know, it's a, it's, you know, it assembles future forecasts of what people believe the value of the stocks will be. What we know about the stock market today is the value comes from a very limited number of stocks. It's not broadly held stocks that are, that are, uh, contributing the real run up in value. So it's the Amazons and the Microsofts and the, and the Googles and, and those who's kind of sit at the top of the, of the uh, market valuation uh, tables. So that's one thing. It's the other thing about the stock market is I believe that the statistic is that 50% of Americans have something in the stock market, but the vast majority of them, 99% of them have less than $100,000. So we have a lot of attention. The reason the stock market is such an important piece is that we actually pay a lot of attention to it. And we assure that our chief executives pay a lot of attention to it by paying them and rewarding them through stock and you know, equity equivalents, but also by using kind of total shareholder return, the roll up of everything that shareholders receive, whether it's you know, price valuations, share buybacks, dividends, all of that becomes the marker this sits at the center of CEO pay and how we, how we, our, our signal of success is tied back to the market. This is the antithesis of what the business roundtable spoke to when they restated the purpose of the corporation, the business roundtable being kind of the, the roll up of the most uh, influential corporations, the largest corporations in our country. So when they came out with a statement a year ago, August, saying that it's about stakeholder capitalism, not shareholder capitalism, um, that set a different conversation forward about the purpose of the corporation. So the stock market, putting, putting the stock market at the center of both kind of measurement and, um, and rewards is kind of the antithesis of what we were talking about when we were talking about a broader corporate purpose. So, you know, all of this creates a lot of complexity. It's a great industry. You know, we, we spent, you know, it's a massive investment in terms of media attention, et cetera, but I don't think it has much to do with the company at all. You know, the company got their money at the IPO. There are more things that are much more important things that are critical to the long-term health of the enterprise than the aftermarket of trading in stock, shares of stock. So this goes back to something else that you talk about a lot in the book, which is uh, you know, some of what some of the challenges are in finance education today. So one of the things that you mentioned and you touched on a little while ago is um, what, what is the dominant message that we're taught about what the purpose of the corporation is? And how do you think that's different from what actually it turns out to be in reality? You know, I think I think finance classrooms are drawn to you know sh profit maximization and shareholder value um, because it's it's teachable, it's straightforward, it's simple to measure. Um, but anybody who's spent any time in business or watches how an executive operates knows that the best of them certainly. But I don't think there's any 
executive any company that's lasted more than you know a week that hasn't had to think about multiple markers of kind of you know all of the inputs of success or hasn't had to be in a constant uh, challenge of managing to multiple kind of inputs and objectives. I mean, it's a balancing act. You know, your employees want this, the community wants this, your shareholders want this, your directors are talking about this. You know, you've got you know deep supply chains, remarkable complexity, companies that are operating out of hundreds of countries around the world. Um, you know, that just doesn't lend itself to a single objective function. It may be fine for some case examples in a finance classroom, but I think we need a new, we need some real fresh thinking in finance on this. Um, clearly the industry is moving on. We certainly read a lot about that. It's hard in this respect for kind of the academic world to catch up with the pace of change in that respect, but we're certainly looking for positive examples and reward positive examples of finance classrooms and well beyond that are speaking to the nuance of success, that are speaking to the complexity and the context in which business operates today and the challenges that business leaders manage to when they put kind of the public interest at the center of their thinking. There's a lot more to do there, but there are wonderful scholars at SOM and beyond, well beyond, that are that do remarkable work in this domain. So when you say that it's it's you know teaching or learning about finance, it's not just about discounted cash flow or the you know capital asset price model. What is it? What 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 else is there that we should be thinking about teaching in, in terms of finance? Well, you know it's you know, we, we, we actually did a report recently, um, which we haven't really released, but we went in deep to understand what is going on in finance classrooms. And it's, you know, one of the challenges is that, um, you know, the tenure system, frankly, this isn't about SOM, this is about, you know, the kind of a finance academy that, you know, people tend to advance in, in tenure, um, if they're using the kind of databases that have been built over you know, some period of time by their peers and by their, the people, their kind of superiors, the people that they have begun to work with and have mentored them. The challenges that are, the challenges that are teachable, however, require a different kind of of, of analysis. It requires taking, it almost is more like case study. You're more like looking at the nuances of how somebody makes decisions. So that means a willingness to teach across disciplines. And that's what brings us back to SOM and to business schools in general. One of the things that's so wonderful about going to a, a great university like Yale and then going to a great business school like SOM is because you actually are at the center of a mix of disciplines that make up the faculty. You know, you, you hire political scientists, you hire sociologists, you hire anthropologists, you hire people who are seated in human behavior. When I went to SOM, everybody from class of 82 out there, you know, we all remember, you know, the OB classes as being the defining experience of our time together at SOM. There, it's about how management makes decisions. That is the ultimately, that's what you're studying. And what is the complexity of that and how do we do that well? So our work at the Aspen Institute is about aligning business decision-making with the test of time, you know, with the health of the enterprise. That requires stepping back from the kind of simplistic measures. They may be useful in a certain case example, but to be able to think about how this decision is, is viewed from lots of perspectives. Back to SOM, the kind of perspectives curriculum, when that was designed, that was the closest thing I personally had seen to a core curriculum in business schools, and I've studied business schools a lot, that really seemed to make this point, that to, to make a good decision that stands the test of time, you simply have to be able to sit in the seat of all kinds of different perspectives. And so I'm kind of preaching to the choir here. SOM has defined this as, 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 as the core part of their first year curriculum. All right, so I wanna get back to um, some of the rules that you talk about in the book. And one of them is 
businesses serve many objectives beyond shareholder values. Can you talk a little bit about what, what some of those other objectives are? You know, the CEO today is a leader of a community. Um, somebody even said to me last week, the CEO is, is a leader of an ecosystem. You have to be able to look at the consequences of the decisions throughout the tail. You, you know, the, the business is not defining its responsibilities. The responsibilities of the corporation are defined well outside the gate, deep in the supply chain. You know, the, the capacity of some NGO to kind of, you know, take hold of your brand and hijack it for purposes that you may not believe are actually even central to your mission or what you're trying to accomplish with your company. But it's a convenience and a, a, a very successful tactic to make sure that issues from climate change, deforestation, the quality of our ecosystem to, you know, human rights and labor conditions around the world. Business is in fact the biggest agent of change here. It doesn't negate the importance of government in terms of, you know, setting the rule of law and raising the bar on, on the private sector. That's obviously a, you know, a, an ongoing conversation that continues to evolve. But business is important. And business has the capacity, the global reach, the distribution systems we need at the table solving these problems. So it is, it's back to kind of what, it, what makes a high quality decision here. And that requires being able to look at that decision from lots of different perspectives like we were just speaking about. So we've talked about the CEOs, the employees, the shareholders. Um, you just mentioned corporate responsibility. Can you talk a little bit about how external activists, um, you gave a lot of great examples of this in the book. Can you like give, uh, talk a little bit about something that you feel has been particularly impactful in terms of an external activist having an effect on a company? One of the people I um, write about is uh, Jason Clay, who um, essentially, analyze supply chains and the commodities that make up um, the kind of make up a vast kind of underbelly of consumer products and, and foods and, and goods. And got it down to a manageable number of commodities and then linked it back to corporations. And in the process of doing that, it starts exposing opportunities to identify a small core of companies and assure that their, their processes are consistent with the long-term health of that commodity. So another example is in the fisheries industry. Um, there's a, um, a wonderful example that comes out of the North Sea and the de rapid decline of, of the kind of fish that make up you know, fish sticks and McDonald's. And the NGO in this case put together McDonald's, the biggest producer in the North Atlantic of cod and, and pollock, and created a understanding between those two, what would need to be the operating protocols in the industry in order to make sure that McDonald's continues to have a safe supply of fisheries, but that those producers can also make a, a, a living wage. And so, that kind of complexity, it took years to put this together, and it has been very, very effective at putting a constraint on the fishing limits and engaging the entire supply chain, including all of these nameless fishermen who are just showing up at the dock and producing and fishing for local producers. So the complexity of this is tremendous. Fish don't get contained. They fish wherever they, they want to fish. So, you know, that kind of example of how you amass a uh, a, a kind of a consortium of players who represent all of the interests and all of the risks and opportunities that need to be in place in order to succeed. So there's lots of examples of this and um, we'll be seeing much more in this. There's much more that needs to happen in the domain of climate, for example. Yeah, for sure, I'm sure we will. Um, I wanna talk about another one of your rules, your rule number six, which is co-create to win. And I think this has also been pulled really from today's headlines. Do you wanna give some examples of how that has been happening recently um, in certain industries? So an example I actually talk about that's not current 
and then I want to get back to the current, really takes us back to the close of World War II, when the business community came together actually long before the war was over, back in 1943, and started essentially saying, what will we need to do to assure that we have jobs for the men when they come home from the front? They weren't too worried about the women at the time, unfortunately, but they were worried about the men and the number of jobs. And the, the consortium that took hold and that required the kind of courage that we need now to basically invest forward and say, we're gonna expend the capital now with the hope that we will rebuild an economy and not go into a post-war depression. So that example is, still speaks to me. It was the foundation of uh, an organization called the Committee for Economic Development, CED. It's now part of the conference board. It's still an example that I think that kind of inspires people. There were millions of businesses that were involved. I think it was something like six or eight million jobs that were created in that period of time. And everyone on this phone knows that we went into a, a very productive cycle, a long economic cycle of growth in the United States but it started with this moment. But let's, let's talk about current events. I mean, this race to develop a vaccine was an important collaboration between governments saying, we're gonna operate differently. We're gonna you know, clear the decks and make sure that we are not an impediment to finding a face safe vaccine. But we also are now learning of how much collaboration took place within the industry competitors coming to the table to share and to learn from one another and to challenge one another. I'm a big fan of the craft beer industry. And one of the things I love about the craft beer industry, other than the product, which I particularly love, is that yes, they compete, but there's an ethic and a, and a kind of a, a sense that we're in this together. And by competing, they're also collaborating and upping each other's game and creating a great IPA. So um, I think there's other examples, there's other industries that function more like that. It's certainly not the norm in a lot of, a lot of businesses, but um, I think this, this example of the vaccine, when we go back and study how this happened, I think it's gonna tell a very interesting tale. Those are great examples. I. Um... I think I'm gonna stop right here with my questions and open it up to questions from the viewers. Um, so everyone who's watching, please feel free to um, add your questions into the Q&A function. And we've already started getting a few. So I'm just gonna go ahead and start with some of those. So we've gotten one. Um, what do you think it will take to reverse the trend toward widespread use of contract labor and unequal wages? Will it come from um, policy change, worker organizing, worker organizing, or something else? Wow, is that an important question? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think it, uh, the, the questioner may have seen a, a reference I made to that in a um, piece that landed in, in Alan Murray's column this morning um, at, at Fortune, Alan Murray, the editor of Fortune magazine. Um, you know, contract, contract labor is one of these, uh, well, I call it a blind spot. You know, the, the, this kind of moment of stakeholder capitalism where, and CEOs, you know, what we've been through in these last months during this, this raging pandemic, we've also seen kind of a humanizing of the corporation in a way. We've, we have had more examples of who makes up the corporation? It's been a, a, a reminder of not just frontline workers, but the complexity of human capital that makes up a successful enterprise. And in that, in that story, what we don't see necessarily is that, all, that the great number of employees, in, by some accounts, it's as much as 50% of a place like Google might be contract workers. We don't really know, it's kind of hard to count. It's hard to measure. Um, the Department of Labor Statistics does not um, make, it's not easy to, because if you ask an employer, an employee where they work, you know, you don't know if they're answering, I work at this address or I work at Amazon, but they actually are working for a, a contractor that Amazon is relying on. So it's hard to track the amount of contract labor. What we do know is it's, it's 
increased tremendously in the last decades. It's a huge contributor to poverty. It may be, I saw some research, some academic research about a year or so ago that said it's the biggest contributor to creation of poverty in the United States. And, um, and we need a new change. So I talked about the, the Google, um, the creation of a Google uh, union. So that's one suggestion that it is not going away as an issue for employees themselves, that they're sitting on the other side of a cubicle from somebody that they know is as a contractor is not making the same wage, doesn't have the benefits, doesn't have the security of employment, may, um, uh, you know, the company may be protected in terms of risks that are borne by that employee in a way that, that um, it's not if it's their own employee. So there's lots of reasons for companies to do this, including of course, the real objective is to operate more cheaply. So um, I think it's gonna come from a, I think it's going to come from a kind of a knowledge. Uh, you know, we talk a lot about gig workers. It turns out that the, you know, the Uber drivers and such are a tiny piece of this puzzle. It's much more the janitors, the cafeteria workers, and core services that can be outsourced and supposedly done more efficiency. But what's really the goal? When we talk about efficiency, what's the goal? Roger Martin has just come out with a book about efficiency that I have not yet tackled, but I'm looking to. And he says it's a canard. As an organizing principle, it's not going to get us to where we need to go. So um, I think the short answer, sorry, that was not a short answer to your question, but I do think that employees play an important role in raising these questions. And um, Ultimately, um, it may require some rule, rule setting by another party, but um, it's certainly, I will say this, it's certainly within the business's own choices that it's making. It's, we call them choice points. This is an area where business has real agency. The design of work, who they employ, who they hire, how they train them, these are all decisions. And importantly, what share of profits go to the shareholders versus are retained for reinvestment in the human kind of capital? I don't know if that's, I hate that word, or somebody's told me I should hate that word, I still use it. Um, the investment back in the employees and those who work in the name of the company but are not on the payroll. That's an important balancing act. In some respects, that's where it's got to start. A topic I'm sure we'll all be hearing much more about in the coming months. Another question that's come in, um, what do you think um, social enterprise might teach us about how to conceive of value and managing conflicting perceptions of value? Well, I suppose it depends on what the, um, what the speaker means by social enterprise. Um, you know, I'm not so sure that I, I'm not one who's real comfortable with these are social enterprises over here and here are non-social enterprises over here. I think these are hard distinctions to be to make. Um, certainly the concept of a B Corp, one that is created with the intentions from its outset, typically, you know, they tend to be smaller enterprises, they tend to be founder-led enterprises, although they certainly there's certainly examples of B Corps or companies that have proclaimed themselves to be a B Corp or have taken, undertaken the certification to be a B Corp, um, you know, Patagonia, you know, parts of Unilever, et cetera. Um, so that's this kind of category of social enterprise. Are we talking about business enterprises that are explicit about their social purpose? Are we talking about nonprofit enterprises that use business-like you know, methods and have characteristics. To me, this is a murky area. My fantasy is that we don't let anybody off the hook. That social enterprises, um, that they serve as powerful examples of value creation that is um, with real intentions and the desire to assure that your operations follow those intentions. So they, they are intentional. It doesn't mean that they're perfect. There may be pieces of a social enterprise where they have their own blind spots. I remember talking to a famous shoe company that is a social enterprise and you know they were giving away a lot of shoes but they hadn't really yet thought about how those shoes are made. So that's the real action. 
the real action is in the business model itself. It can't be about CSR down the hallway or the philanthropy or the charity or the aspects of it that seem socially interesting and that you're speaking to. I think what, we, what we're talking about here is an ability to think deeply about the decisions that are available to the company and the consequences of decisions throughout the business model. That's where the real action is. And that's where the real leverage and opportunity is as well. Great. So going back to businesses, um, one question came in, are businesses still maintaining the position that zero regulation is what they need? And do you think there's a model that could make um, government's role more understandable to businesses? You know, I don't know that I, I think the businesses are looking for zero regulation. I think the best businesses, one of the things that get, that is kind of interesting to talk about is that the businesses that often get targeted and kind of tagged with bad practices, they're not necessarily the worst actors. They're just the kind of confluence of there's something to talk about and the biggest brands that um, will make the issue visible because of the, the power of the brand. So, um, sorry, what was it, the part about the question? The question was, um, do you think there's some model that will make government's role more understandable yeah. or palatable to businesses? So I think that the best actors in business, um, it behooves them to raise the bar because if they're already a good actor, they want to raise the bar and make sure that everybody else has to follow along so that they don't have a, a more costly business model as a result of leaning in. So this is a complex dance between business and government, business raising the bar, business or government raising the bar, business sometimes fighting to deregulate. Clearly there's abusive examples of too much regulation. We all read about these and kind of probably say, well, how can we get this right? How do we, how do we um, you know, operate with principles and you know, maybe get rid of some of the cost of regulation? But you know, the, the devil's in the details here and um, it's not an area in which I have any kind of superior knowledge about how that goes well. There were certainly examples back in the Clinton administration where they tried to, to reduce the policing and allow the industry to police itself. And some of those ended up not going so well. So I think it's a complicated area. Um, but I do think that um, when businesses, um, the businesses that benefit the most are the ones who are already the best actors. So, you know, the, the costs to them are not as great. And, um, Yeah. So uh, we have another question. Hi, Judy. Would love to hear a little bit more about the limits of financial models and what might faculty and students do to better understand those limits and place financial models within a broader decision making toolkit. In place of broader, say that party, last part again. And place financial models within a broader decision making toolkit. Oh, um... You know, when we when we first started working in business schools years ago, um, and I don't know if StudiQ is online today, but um, I'm a big fan of the center that he has built at SOM, the Joint Center between the Forestry School and SOM. Um, it's a real source of great talent out there, and um, it's a proud piece of the SOM community. Um, but we started, we basically used the word stewardship. We started a partnership with the World Resources Institute, where we created a product called Beyond Gray Pinstripes, and it was a ranking of business schools. It was kind of an audacious thing to do. It ended up um, being costly as well as we started having to make judgments about, you know, hundreds of business schools around the globe. But it ended up creating a, a lot of conversation in business schools and giving shine, you know, putting some light on, on scholars that were doing innovative work. And the word stewardship, I like because you invoke the, the kind of sense of time frame. You know, the problem with the finance and the, the measures of success that finance classrooms use is the kind of, you know, discounted cash flows methodology assumes that you can cast forward and um, 
you know, predict cash flows and the value of assets and then discount them back at some, I'm talking to the SOM community here, you guys should be telling me this, I've been, I've been in business school for decades now, but you know, that somehow that we will be able to realize today or assess today the value of these future cash flows. You know, the fact is you can't discount back the, you know, value of a healthy stream. You know, I talk, I, I um, start the book with, a meeting that we held in, in Aspen years ago with a, a group of finance scholars. And one of the people we invited to that meeting was David Blood, who uh, did not go to SOM, but um, did go to business school. And he was head of asset management at Goldman Sachs for a number of years. And then he started his own firm, Generation Investment, which is a remarkably um, successful um, management uh, asset management firm. And um, he sat there with these scholars and he looked down, you know, there was a roaring, we're right on top of the Roaring Fork uh, River. And um, he looked down and he said, how do you put a price on that fish? And literally one of the scholars, you know, took his bait, so to speak, and said, you can't, you can't price the fish. But what's, what's more, we don't need to because it's an externality, something to that effect. It was like a cartoon version of, you know, that cartoon that was in the New Yorker that made its way around. Indra Nui used to use it a lot in speeches where the guy's sitting around the campfire and he says, you know, and it's these disheveled children and it's kind of clearly the, you know, apocalypse has come and they're kind of foraging in the forest and sitting around a campfire with a group of kids. And he goes, for, you know, yes, we destroyed the world, but for a moment in time, we created a lot of shareholder value. So I'll just leave you with that thought. That's great. Um, next question. This is, a, this is a really good question. Um, where do you think we are in terms of implementing true sustainability? Hmm. I think we could ask the audience that question. Uh, we've got a long ways to go. I mean, we're on the, you know, we're on the, we are experiencing climate change. Um, this is not anything new to this audience. Um, we have a limited number of years to price the, the pollution, to price the, the cost here, to make sure that we, we are all part of this problem and Markets are clearly a part of it. We need change in behavior. We need serious ramping up in investment for sure. But we also need to um, engage in the political process that's going to help assure that the United States becomes a leader again on this. I mean, we're, we're certainly our, many of our companies are leaders. I mean, there was this remarkable moment in January where where Microsoft um, made their kind of claim and their, you know, put out their plan, uh, including significant investment in carbon capture and the willingness to share that with uh, with competitors as well. Um, we've got the we've got the capacity. We need the will, and there are winners and losers, but it's getting more obvious how important it is that we go with those who will win in this respect. So, um, you know, to me, this is, the, this is the question that keeps me awake. This is the one, it's about climate change. And are we going to, are we gonna face it down or not? And uh, we have a historic opportunity now. We have the business community, I believe fully aligned. There will clearly be those who work behind the scenes to slow things down. We have many states and localities that have stepped in. We have a new administration that's committed to real change. And we have a moment of time where we may even have the ability to make, make things work in Congress. But we're gonna, it's gonna take all of us. Yeah, one of the most important questions of our time, if not the most important. Um, another question coming up. If you had your way, what would be the one fundamental change you would make to capitalism as we know it? Well, as we know it, I think the shareholder still is at the center. Um, you know, capitalism goes by lots of different names. Um, the change that I most wish we could make is that we'd be at a point in time where it doesn't have to have lots of descriptors to try to negate 
the you know the negatives here. I mean, capitalism can't flourish um, in a moment or when trust is not robust. And we've suffered for years in a lack of trust in our most important institutions. Business is one of them. Government also suffers from the same thing. So I want to see capitalism just to mean capitalism. I don't want to have to call it conscious capitalism. I don't want to have to call it sustainable capitalism or you know, long-term capitalism or whatever. I just would like us to be living in American-styled capitalism that works for everybody and um, not Pollyannish about this. I mean, not every, I'm not talking about communism. I'm talking about using markets um, to uh, address needs of those who have tremendous need, as well as those who are already being served well by the system. It's the system today is not, um, it's not serving us well. There was a great article that Charles Duhigg published in, um, he was in the New Yorker a few weeks ago that I would recommend to everybody, I don't remember the name of it, but it, it examined the venture capital industry and it used WeWork as a case example and how the, what has become more common place protocols and practices in the venture capital industry tends to focus in on one particular actor, floods them with capital, makes it possible for them to you know, engage in predatory pricing to beat down and eliminate competitors. And then what do we end up with? We end up with, in this case, one entity that then ends up failing us. This, these stories rarely end well here. There are people who get tremendously wealthy as a result of that. But um, there are so many SOMers that I have known over the course of my career. First, when I left SOM, I was in banking, but then I was at the Ford Foundation for a decade. And there were so many SOMers, so many students who graduated at the time I did, and since then, who really believed in harnessing markets for the public good. That's why we went to business school. We wanted to understand how things work. We wanted to understand how decisions are made. How do you manage well? What does that look like? We wanted the experience, we wanted the case example, and we needed that inspiration to, of these cases to understand when it works really well, how powerful that can be. And I believe that's why many people still pursue business education. They believe it's gonna help unlock um, doors to them uh, that, they, that they need unlocked in order to tackle complicated problems. And so, you know, capitalism is just, it's the name for what we have here. And so my wish is that um, we, we can rebuild a, a robust um, market that is gonna serve people who are in the middle of the country as well as people on the coast of the country that, um, you know, create capital markets that are about um, serving needs and, um, and helping build robust markets as opposed to helping a small fraction um, do very, very well at the expense of everyone else. So, Yeah, agreed. And, and, I, and I agree with you that, that I do think that that's why people still go to business school and particularly to uh, SOM. Another great question that came in. It seems like campaign finance reform may be the most important thing we can do to reclaim democracy. Do you agree? And what would you recommend? Oh, man, do I agree. You know, if I wasn't doing the job I have, I'd be working on, on, um, on campaign finance reform. Um, I think they're kind of, I used to think of them as kind of twin problems, both root causes, you know, the the purpose of the corporation to me is a is a fundamental question. So is the question about money and politics. The guy who's written so brilliantly on this for so many years is Robert Reich. And he wrote something um, that I, I literally got somebody to pick up when they were gonna be in my office and bring it home. It's, it's been on my, the floor of my office for as many decades as I've been working, I feel like. Um, 
and he wrote at the time, I think it was a kind of a manuscript that he produced at the end of the 1970s. And he essentially said, business can't have it both ways. You can't, you can't um, depend on the rule of law and need the rule of law and hold that up as an ideal of you know, American democracy. And at the same time, be trying to influence that law through dispensing money in, in, um, you know, to politicians. It's just inconsistent. We need to get back to a place where the rules of engagement, the rules are being set by the people through their representatives. I'm not saying that's all wrong all the time, but it feels, and since Citizens United, we've felt an even greater surge of money in politics. You know, at the end of the Georgia election, I was personally pleased with the outcome, but I remember thinking about this, this guy, Asaf. He's 33 years old. How much of his day is he gonna spend now at age 33, maybe he'll get a year off because he's a senator and he won't have to start doing this immediately. How much time is he going to spend dialing for dollars? Mm -hmm. no, that's, an, that's a travesty. That is not, that is not why we put somebody like that in. Um, so I feel st really strongly about this. I believe profoundly that this moment where business has been stepping back and saying, wait a minute, what do I do to unwind? First of all, who did I actually give money to? And how do I unwind the consequence of having staked a politician who seems to be undermining the very thing that I am dependent on for the health of my company? This is a, this is a reckoning. Will it sustain the conversation long enough for corporations to have to say, why am I doing this to begin with? What is the purpose of money in politics? This is not a free speech issue. Companies will be listened to. They are major employers. They are critical assets in all communities. They are investors in public you know, infrastructure and the builders of public infrastructure. Of course, we're gonna to continue to listen to business executives and to companies and need to know how they think and how they are experiencing um, you know, the kind of complicated goods and services that government provides. They're not, that's not that's going away, but um, we do need to rethink the role of money in politics. There's a great example, IBM did get, I think Dealbrook did a piece today, um, Sorkin that quoted uh, that interview Ginny Romedy and IBM has never, from the time of Tom Watson 100 years ago, there was always a prohibition against using the company's assets. There is also no PAC, so employees can give to whoever they want to, but there's no organized effort by the company to, um, you know, assemble investment in the name of the company. Why not? Let's get back to that as a principle. Let's use that as our protocol. Great. Next question um, touches on something that you talk about uh, in your book. It's uh, corporate board governance continues to be excessively management friendly. Do you see, or how do you see, um, what, what do you think is gonna be required to deal with issues like runaway executive pay and inequality? Um, what, what sorts of approaches do you think are needed? Well, thank you for that question. It's my favorite topic, uh, CEO pay. It's one of the blind spots. CEOs setting intentions over here saying we're going to, you know, all, all stakeholders are important to us. Back home, you know, total shareholder return is at the center of their pay package. Um, in the last decade, companies have been paying out 90% of profits to the shareholder. That does not leave a lot for, you know, employees to participate in the great American dream here. Corn Ferry is our partner on our work on pay. Their research says that the senior team, um, that their pay has been increasing on an average of 7% a year for the last decade. Employees, middle managers on down, it's been 3%. So this is designed for inequality. 
There are, we produced a set of principles in September that were released on the same day that the Business Roundtable released their policy statement on, on climate. Um, they released on September 9th. Um, we're working to give them more visibility. It's, it's years of work in analyzing what's going on with pay. This is not about CEOs needing to don hair shirts and not be able to you know, have enough money to send their children to school or something here. This is, we're talking about a fundamental reset and a re-examine and a modernization of the principles of pay. Pay has been pretty much stuck for decades. Um, the job of the CEO has changed, but pay has not caught up with that. So we're looking at greater simplicity. We're looking at defining fairness. We're looking at the role of boards and their need to stop and reflect on what's the right relationship between the CEO's pay and his or her direct reports between the management team and the rest of the enterprise. And again, back to this fundamental question, how much do we set aside for shareholders and how much do we set aside for reinvestment in employees and workforce development and all of those needs that we have to continue to build a healthy enterprise. So there's a lot to be said about this. We, it requires moving away from the benchmarking system that measures you know, peers and a, uh, a reconsideration of how pay needs to work for the enterprise itself. And that's, gonna, that's a fundamentally different way to think about fairness and comparisons, but that's where the action is today and that's where we need to refocus. Well, I'm glad we got to end on one of your favorite topics. Thank you so much. I, um, we got so many questions and there were so many that we didn't get to. I'm sorry that we couldn't get to more of them in the limited amount of time that we had. Um, I want to direct all of our viewers to um, our website, alumni.som.yale.edu to find out more about our program and more about future events. And I just wanna thank you so much, Judy. This has been really wonderful. Um, I think we all learned a lot. I think it's been really great to get some pearls of wisdom from you. Um, wish you the best of luck with your book. And I'm sure that we will see you again um, at many more events going forward. So thank you again to all of you who have attended and thank you so much, Judy. Thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity. Hugs and kisses to all of my friends in the SOM community you may have been on today. I see notes from Tony Sheldon and others and um, I mean, it's really been a pleasure and I look forward to connecting again. Thank you so much, Margie, for having me. Great. Right, thank you. Bye, everyone.